We're going to talk today about how we build a culture around engaging our employees. Now, this idea obviously isn't anything new, right? What's the benefit of having engaged employees? I'm sorry? More productive? Okay, absolutely. More loyal, loyal, less turnover? Absolutely, right? So we know this. The key is not only how do we get our people engaged, but I believe the magic sauce, as you heard in the last presentation, is how do we keep them there? That's the real challenge. We can do all the little things that keep people happy and wanting to come to work every day, but how do we turn that into true business results? I'm a big believer that anything that we do for or with our people has to have an end in mind. In other words, if we're going to spend money on a holiday party, what's the end in mind, right? What's the bang for our buck? If we're going to give someone a pay raise, what's the end in mind with that pay raise, right? So anytime we spend money on our employees, there has to be a trade-off there. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we get that trade-off? How do we get the people engaged? How do we keep them engaged? So let's take a look at a couple of things we're going to chat about today. I want to look at the key behaviors of all levels of employees, from your most senior down to your newest, from your most entry level up to your most experienced and most responsible in the organization, because we expect something different out of each of those folks, right? And so we're going to look at what that means. How do we identify the behaviors that we need out of people that are going to drive business results? And then we're going to talk about this concept of line of sight. Anyone heard of line of sight previously? Excellent. Good. So we're going to learn that line of sight is is when someone can look at their job and know that what they do every single day has a direct correlation to how the business is doing, that they're impacting business results. And that's going to be our key to not only engaging our people, but keeping them in that most productive zone is keeping that line of sight going. And then we're going to wrap up with some incentive plans. You know, how do, we, how do we keep our people motivated around this idea of, hey, what I do matters, what I do is contributing to the bottom line, and I know that I'm making a difference every single day I show up. Because that's really what engagement's all about. A lot of people think engagement is about happiness. Well, if I have happy employees, they're engaged. No, not necessarily. They're just happy. I'm sure you got plenty of happy employees that maybe aren't your best people. That's probably because you're paying them to do very little. That's why they're so happy, right? Um, And so what we care about is not only happy employees and satisfied employees, but people that can get around our mission and take our company where we want to take it. Now, I did give uh, Frazier and the team here a PDF of the the slide, so you're going to get that. And because it is Easter weekend, there are some Easter eggs in there for you of some additional information that we're not going to have time to cover today. So make sure that you pull that, uh, that down for yourself. All right, so why is this so important? I'm a little bit of a numbers geek, and so I want to talk just real briefly about some, some cool studies that are out there on engagement and specifically on this, this concept of line of sight. So as you can see, Wharton did a, did a study, and they found that one of the key obstacles that executives identified to not being able to hit their strategic plan and the company goals was lack of ownership amongst the employees. So think about that for a minute. Our people, for whatever reason, are showing up every day. They're punching the clock every day. But they don't really own it. They don't really own their job. They may not really own the results we're trying to achieve. There lies the challenge for us, okay? Some other studies by Wharton also seem to indicate that if a person can see, hey, what I do contributes to the bottom line of this company, or contributes to the mission of the organization, or the values, or or whatever you might use as a measuring stick, these people are much more productive, they're much more engaged, and they become talkers up of your brand, which is a huge, huge thing for us in the service business, right? And so we need employees that are not just happy and good service providers, but are out in the community talking about not only what a great place to work your entity is, but what a great service you provide to your clients. I was with a a credit union a few months back, 
that was really struggling on this front to the point that I, I interviewed all the executives. Several of the members of the executive team said that if they were at a cocktail party, they would not tell you they worked at this particular credit union. Wow, right? Wow. I mean, the first time I heard it, I thought, okay, this lady's got sour grapes. Something's going on here. And then I heard it again. And then I heard it a third time. And I'm thinking, you guys are the executives. We're talking C-suite here. And when I sat down with the board, I said, well, I figured out your problem, right? If you have an executive team that is, I guess embarrassed is the only way to put it, of working here, how can you possibly expect to grow this credit union and grow your membership? Wow. And so this is a real powerful one. We've got to show people that what they do matters every single day. And finally, we also know, and you guys mentioned it, with my first question, we know that people that have a direct line of sight and know that their job makes a difference, less turnover, more productive, you see it on the screen. They're loyal, right? Now, this doesn't mean that they're always happy, okay? So again, I, I, I don't want to confuse engagement with happiness. We all have our days, right? We all have our days where we arrive at the office and the, the kids were late getting on the school bus and the dog doo-dooed on the floor in the night, and all the, you know, it's a cruddy way to start the day, right? And we get to work, and we're like, oh, we're not real happy at that moment. But what really matters is that we're still committed to making a difference that day. That's what's so critical, and that's what we're going to focus on here this morning. All right, so my definition of what this line of sight means is it's the, it's the perception that an employee has that what they do matters and makes a difference. Now, I was giving a, a talk on this topic, uh, well, back when we were having talks like this, over, a little over a year ago, right? And someone raised their hand and they said, Ed, what do I do if I have someone whose job doesn't really matter when it comes to driving business results? I went, huh. What do you think I said to that woman? Her question was, what do I do with a job whose position really does not impact our business results? Get rid of the job. Rid of the job. <laughs> exactly. Show me a job that you have that doesn't impact who you are as an entity, and I'll show you a job you don't need. Oh, but I'm thinking of a data entry clerk. Okay, well... Might it be important for that person to enter data correctly so that your records are current? I mean, you guys are in the medical field. We can't have people misentering data, right? That, that's not a good outcome for us. Well, what about the custodian, Ed? Okay, well, what's the first impression you want your customers to have when they walk in to your facilities? I mean, the reality is, and no offense, guys, but are your businesses running just fine while you're here at this conference? We hope so, right? And that's not, it's actually, people are always hesitant to answer that. They're like, oh, well, if I say yes, maybe I'm not needed. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a good thing. If things are running well in your absence, that's awesome. That's the way it should be. But what happens if your custodian's off for the day? And someone spills coffee on the floor. The wastebaskets are overflowing. I mean, there, are, there is visible evidence that that person isn't there that day. So I, I'll, I love to debate this sort of thing with folks when they say, oh, I got a position that, that really doesn't, doesn't meet this criteria, Ed. Because I haven't found one yet that doesn't truly matter in delivering what we need to deliver to our customers. So when I think about line of sight, there's two ways we can focus on this. One's a little bit easier than the other. The first one we call short line of sight. Now, employees love this. This is where I might give someone goals that are daily based or weekly based or even monthly based, but not much longer than that, right? So uh, think about your receptionist or whoever greets your patients when they first walk in the door, okay? You expect them to smile, uh, maybe offer some assistance to that person, point them in the right direction, get their name, whatever it is, very basic job functions, but they are the face of your organization, Okay? for that first person who walks in the door. So a short line of sight for them would be how they answer the phone every day, 
how quickly they can route patients to the right care provider. Um, can they give directions if you've got a larger facility to get people through the facility and to the section that they need? Those kinds of things. Now, the nice thing is employees love short line of sight because at the end of the day, they go home and they say, yeah, I made a difference today. I know I made a difference in, in what's going on. What's the challenge to a short line of sight, though, from a management perspective? Um, it, it is repetitive, and that might be the nature of the job, to be repetitive. But what's your challenge as an executive with short line of sight? Don't know, it. That's why we're here listening to you. <laughs> the challenge typically is, as management folks, is we like to have a longer view. Because we know that what happens in one day doesn't necessarily dictate whether or not we're profitable for the week, the month, the quarter, the year, right? There are always going to be the hiccups along the way. So we, in management, like to have a longer line of sight. We like to focus on the goals that are longer than a month, typically quarterly goals, certainly annual goals. If you've got a strategic plan, it's a three-year, five-year strategic plan, whatever it is, right? Those are the goals that you're focused on. And so what we have to do is rectify these two. We've got to satisfy our need for the longer-term goals so that the cyclicalness of our business is taken into account while still satisfying the employee's need to know pretty much at the end of the day, end of the week, that what they did mattered. good friend of mine back home owns a landscaping company. And we were talking about this concept, and he said, Ed, you know, my employees think that, um, and he does commercial level landscaping. He says, my employees think that when they go out and, and they mow a property or in the winter when they plow it, that that was a good day's job, right? Because the job was finished that day. They were told to go out to the industrial park, mow the industrial park, they knocked it out that day. They think it's a good job. He said, but the reality is it rains and I can't mow every day. It doesn't snow all winter long, thank goodness. And so, I need to look at things on a monthly, a quarterly basis on what's happening and set my goals there. And so that's the, that's the dichotomy, if you will, between what the employees think is a job well done and what we know the business needs. And so we've got to find a way to satisfy both of those masters. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the, the morning. And so what I want you to think about is that employees love this short line of sight. So when we develop goals for them, when we're thinking about where the firm goals are, we have to think about, okay, if I'm an employee, not only how do I hit that goal, but how will I know that I hit the goal? How will I know at the end of my work day or my work week that what I did mattered today or mattered this week, that I know I made a difference, okay? But in management, we know we need the longer-term measures. We need to see things over the long haul. And so the challenge is when we goal set with our employees, we've got to take our company goals and start to cascade them down. So where's the organization need to go? Okay, great, we've got those goals. Now each department or each function should have goals that support the organizational goals. And then within each function, each person has goals that support where the function's going, that supports where the business is going, okay? So it's a flow down and a flow back up again. If we can craft those goals and those business measurable results that way, uh, some would call that your key performance indicators, we can rectify these two things. We can rectify our need for longer sight so that we know what we're doing is impacting our bottom line, with the employee's need for that sort of instant satisfaction. And so where a lot of organizations mess up is they forget that the employees need that short line of sight. And so they set all their goals and their reward systems around quarterly or annual type goals. Well, heck, I mean, profit sharing's nice or something along those lines, but if you're only touching that person once a year, it's nice, it's usually a nice check if you're doing something like that, but... The challenge is, are they engaged all year long? That's what you have to ask yourself. Okay? So here's a couple you know, interesting tidbits. So it shouldn't be a surprise 
that people that have been with us for a longer level of time and are higher in level with the organization have a better line of sight. Does that, does that surprise anybody? Shouldn't, right? Because we know they've been around, they've seen there, they've, done, they, they've been there, they've done that, they've kind of seen it all at that point, okay? But what I find interesting is that think about the people who have the, the most contact with your customers. It's the receptionist. It's your nurses, probably. Um, maybe it's um, physical therapy techs, right? It's those folks. How often do they see those types of folks in your practice versus seeing the docs? And so the question is, when we look at this, and we, have, we hire that new physical therapist in, or we hire that new nurse in, do we express to them how important their job is in the continuity of care? Or do we just assume, well, they went into the medical field because they love people and they want to heal people? I hope so, right? But do they understand how what they do connects the dots into where we're heading as an organization? That's what's key. And a lot of organizations miss that when they're onboarding new employees. They're, they're quick to talk about all the fluffy stuff. Oh, we got a holiday party, and we do bonuses, and, and you get you know, X amount of days off a year, and all that fluffy stuff. But we never really take the time to talk to them about why their job matters and why them hitting their results matters to the organization. What is the real importance of this position? That's a key thing that, not, that has to start right at onboarding time and carries right through the entire life cycle of employment. And then finally, I, I find this interesting, and I want to talk about this one a little bit. There are studies out there that would indicate that people who have less positions in your company, in other words, they haven't moved around a whole lot within your firm, have a better line of sight. Anyone want to take a guess at why that might be? So we know the newbies don't have much time. We know someone who's, who's had very few positions is okay. Why would someone who has fewer positions have a greater line of sight? They're more invested in the organization? That means they're more invested and they have less contribution. Okay, so perhaps they're, they're more invested in the contribution they're giving. Okay. Think about the person who comes into your organization as an entry-level employee, whatever that happens to be for you, and they're in that role for a year or so, and then they, hop, they, they get some training or whatever, they hop into another position. They're in that position for a year or so. Then they get some additional training, we promote them into a new position in a year or so. You see what, what's happening? They're moving around, okay? Now, logic would say, well, gosh, if they're, Ed, if they're coming at it from all these different angles, they should have a really cool line of sight. But the studies say something different is happening. That because they're hopping so quickly, they don't see enough business cycles to really understand how each of those positions they just hung on to for a year, year and a half, two years, really were impacting the business results. So I'm, what I'm not telling you to do is to get people stuck in their careers, okay, and not move them through your organization. Not saying that at all. But we have to do it intentionally, and we have to make sure that as we're developing them and every stop along the way, that they can connect the dots. That's what's critical, connecting the dots. Should be no surprise that if, you, if you've got part-timers or maybe you do a temp to, to hire kind of situation, these people, very low line of sight. They're the forgotten ones. How many of you use part-time people to staff your operations? Only a couple? Okay, all right, a few of you. Um, oftentimes, these folks, we, we bring them in, we say, yeah, you're going to work 20 hours a week, thank you very much, and we give them their schedule. And that's kind of the last we hear about them. We don't have to worry about benefits because they're, they're not full-time. They're the forgotten people. And yet, those of you that hire part-time people are most of them customer-facing. Yeah, I'm seeing the heads nodding, right? Anyone who is customer-facing is so critical to our operation. They make or break us, right? Think about the last time you went shopping, like actual shopping, not, not Amazon shopping. You went to the mall, right? 
and you got bad service from that retail associate. You probably went home and you said to yourself, well, I'm not sure I'm going back there again anytime soon. And what's that retail associate? Maybe a college kid working for some extra bucks, maybe a high schooler. Certainly they're part-time, right? And they impacted your view of the organization. And so don't ignore your part-timers. But on a bigger scale, definitely don't ignore those folks that you have that are frontline touching your patients every single day. Because they're the ones, honestly, that are making or breaking your practice. Yes, your docs are critical. They're the ones that are diagnosing and performing surgery, whatever, whatever they happen to need to do for that particular patient. But again, think about the staff that your patient sees more often than the doc. They're the people where we, they're often the forgotten ones, and they're the ones we've got to focus on if we really want to hit our business results. Now, I love this model. This is not my model. This was developed by an organization called World at Work. But it's so critical to understanding how this all flows to business results. And I want to start all the way over here on the left-hand side, okay, with business strategy. Do you have a strategic plan? Or at least, even if it's not written down in a formal one, do you have it in your head? Do you have a couple of goals for the organization? If so, great. You should. I hope you do. Okay? But look at what happens with that business strategy. That business strategy drives your organizational culture. I get calls all the time saying, Ed, help us with our culture. Okay, well, let's talk about your business strategy. Oh, I, we, what do you mean, our business strategy? Well, what's your plan for how you do business? That's going to drive your culture. And again, culture is not driven by having the holiday parties and the wellness lunches and you know, all the other things we do to keep people happy. That does not drive culture. It's our business model that drives culture. There's essentially three types of business strategy. Okay? The first is product or service leadership. So an organization that focuses on product or service leadership says, you know what, we are putting the best thing on the market that money can buy. And people will spend more money with us because it is the best product or service money can buy. When you think about product or service leadership, what companies come to mind? Apple, okay? I hear Apple all the time, and I would agree that Apple puts phones out there that cost a thousand bucks, right? And people line up to drop their money every time the new iPhone drops, okay? Because they're at the cutting edge of technology. Now, the second, so, so again, think about this. If, if that's your business model, product or service leadership, then that means you're not worried about cost. You're worried about providing the best medical care to your patients that money can buy. That you've recruited the best and the brightest docs and care providers money can buy in order to provide the best care to your patients. Okay? That would be your business focus. Second type of business focus or business strategy is customer intimacy. So this type of business says, you know, we are going to build relationships with our customers that will get them to the point that they don't even want to think about going anywhere else. We're so inextricably tied. And that means they may spend more, but it's not necessarily because the product or service is at the, is at the top notch. It's the relationship that we have with the customer. Who comes to mind a business that maybe you deal with that is customer intimate? Ooh, is this a sad state of affairs in, a, in American business that we, we don't have any customer intimate companies? Chick-fil-A. Chick -fil you know, I would agree. Be, I, I'm not much of a fast food guy, but every time you drive past a Chick-fil-A, like, the cars wrap around the building three times to get through the drive through I'm like, what's going on in there? Is there free money being handed out? Yesterday at the airport, the line for Chick-fil-A was longer than the Starbucks line. I mean, that, like, doesn't happen, Right. What's that? Government land. Uh, that, see? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> something, they're doing something right. 
There's something in the chicken nuggets at Chick-fil-A that people want them. And I mentioned Starbucks. Is that not a customer intimate company as well? People love their Starbucks. Now, if there are Starbucks lovers in the room, I'm sorry, to me, coffee's coffee. I would, I would argue with you that, yes, yeah, Starbucks is probably better than your average coffee, but five bucks a cup, I don't know, <laughs> right? Um, but people love their Starbucks. They've, they've connected that, okay? And so people are willing to spend five bucks for a cup of coffee instead of 99 cents right next door at the McDonald's takeout, okay? Final kind of or type of business strategy is operational excellence, This type of company drives its values to its customers through how it runs its internal operations. They get things so streamlined that they can drive great value to their customers. Anyone come to mind? Amazon, absolutely. Great logistics background. You order it right now, it shows up at your house tomorrow morning. What the heck just happened, right? Who else? I'm sorry? Walmart, thank you. Nobody wants to put Walmart in any one of these categories, right? Walmart's like that, um, that I, I, I don't know, that, that entity we all want to keep locked in the closet. No one wants to admit they go to Walmart, right? Well, somebody's shopping at Walmart because their parking lots are jammed, right? Anyone ever gotten the front row parking spot at Walmart? Like, I don't know who these people are that they're getting there. But the reality is that, yes, Walmart has an, an amazing logistics system behind what it does. And, yes, they do beat their vendors over the head and, and cost cut on that front, too. But they have an amazing logistics system. I'm a former UPS guy. UPS. Operational excellence. So what you have, the reason I, I give you that, that little sidetrack is you have to decide what business strategy are we focusing on. Now, you might have your foot in in one or two, and you're probably serving all three masters a little bit, but I guarantee you there's one that you say, we've got to be this one. We have to be if we're going to impact our customers and drive our business results. And so when you look at this then, you've got to say, okay, depending on the business strategy that I'm going to focus on, that's how I'm going to educate my people, which is going to drive my culture, and it's going to drive my HR strategy, because it's going to inform on the type of people we need to recruit, employ, engage, and retain. Once we know our business strategy. I've talked to a lot of people that have a, a, a very sales type culture in their organization. And then they turn around and they hire salespeople that can't close. They're great relationship builders, they can't close the deal. Something's wrong there, right? Do you want an account manager who's just kind of keeping the customer happy? Or do you want a true salesman who's going to go in, sell your company, sell your product, sell your service, and close the deal and get that yes from the customer? Two different skill sets, okay? And so one bit of homework I'd ask you to do as you're thinking about your takeaways from the conference is what is our business strategy currently? Have we articulated it? And then more importantly, as we're going to see here shortly, have we articulated it to our people so that they know why that's our business strategy? Because you see, all of that wraps around our total rewards strategy, how we pay our people, train our people, the benefits we give them, how much of a work-life fit, work-life integration, use whatever term you want, can they have working with us, okay? The magic sauce is in that total reward strategy right here, okay? We get that right, we attract, motivate, and retain the right people, okay? And when we do that, look what happens. That's where the satisfaction and the engagement come from. But for the first time in this model, there's a break right here. And that's where if we don't get line of sight right, and we're going to see in a minute how we get it right, if we don't get it right, we don't get the business performance and results that we need. And you notice that's a a back and forth arrow. Again, it's the only place where the arrow goes back and forth. Because the more that we can drive employee satisfaction and engagement, the more they drive business results. The better business results we get, the more we can reinvest in the business, creating more opportunities for more people and for the people that we have, and the cycle starts all over again. It becomes that that snowball rolling downhill, right? I love, I love, I love this model. Print it out, throw it on your your wall, and think about it. Think about how this works in your organization and how it could work 
in your organization or should work in your organization. So we're going to look at a four-step process for making this happen for you. Okay? It's not a very complicated process. It's time-consuming. takes effort. Not complicated, though. Okay? So the first thing we've got to think about is, what's our message? And that's why I took some time to talk about your business strategy. Because that's going to determine what your message is to your people. If you stepped in front of your people this afternoon and you said, hey, our business strategy is to have the, the best medical care money can buy, would people say, yes, that makes sense? Or might they say, well, what about maybe someone who doesn't have insurance? Is that, are, are we going to lose out on those folks? Or, or what about someone who can't afford the best medical care? Are we losing that part? We have to be prepared to answer those kinds of questions in whatever way we feel we need to answer those questions. Okay? If you stood up and you said, we're going to be all about operational excellence. We are going to streamline operations. We're going to be just smoking along with how we process things. You're probably going to get, well, what about the, the customer? What about our patients? Don't we care about our patients anymore? It's all about the processes. Okay? And so when we think about our core message, it has to go back to that business strategy. Who is the best group of people to develop the core message? Is it all of you? Got a couple heads nodding. Or you're saying no. Why not? Because your employees are invested and they have as much to develop what your core message is. Ah. If our people are invested, they'll have as much, and what was the word you used? I don't remember. Don't remember? <laughs> They'll have as much to, I'll ad lib, they'll have as much to gain or lose as you do from getting this message correct. I think it has to be a team approach because we have to talk to people in the way they need to hear it in order to drive results. Now, when I say that, a lot of people go, oh, so you're saying you got to dumb it down. No, not what I said. What I said is they have to, he to hear the message in the way they need to hear it, which means you may need to create a couple of different messages for different groups in your organization based on what they need to hear in order to create that line of sight for themselves. You would probably create a slightly different message for your accounting function than you would for your physical therapist, than you would for your nurses. Right? They might need to hear the message slightly different okay, in order to relate. Okay, now I see that what I'm doing connects the dots back up to this business strategy. So the one-size-fits-all message is not a good idea here. Okay? So give employees part of the message development. Maybe it's in the way of a um, couple of focus groups, that sort of thing. I was working with an organization whose employee opinion survey results, they, they did it every year, and they had just tanked. And they said, hey, would you come in and run some focus groups as, as an, you know, an outsider and help us understand what's going on here? And so as we were talking through things, one of the, the gentlemen raised his hand, and, and he says, Ed, I want, I want us to go on a little field trip. Let's go down to the lunchroom, and I want you to look at the communication wall. Now, this company uh, ba based... Um, here in the U.S., but is a German-owned company. You probably have their products in your home, quite honestly. It's a large company. And we go down to the lunchroom, and I'm looking at the wall, and I see all kinds of facts and figures and all the stuff you would expect to see, you know, relating to benefits and that kind of stuff. I said, I don't understand. What, what am I looking for? He says, just look a little bit closer at the financial statements. Because they were posting, hey, we did, you know, this much business this month and so on. Every financial parameter that was listed on that bulletin board was reported in euros. Now, I don't know about you guys, I don't know what the going conversion rate is on euros on any given day. I know that if we're up a million euros, that's a good thing, right? But I don't know what that really means in terms of financial capacity for us. But because they were German-owned, no one was taking the time to just hit the convert button in Excel. 
when the plant manager would get up to give her State of the Union address on a quarterly basis. Everything was reported in euros, and people were staring, going, I don't know, okay, we're up, great, okay, woohoo. But there was a disconnect, okay? So ask yourself how often maybe you fall into that trap where you're reporting on things that the masses don't fully grasp. And not because they're not capable of grasping it, it's because the message doesn't fit them. Okay? Finally, with the core message, be careful of those company-wide rollouts. I know it's nice and we can bring everyone together for an all-employee meeting and, oh, everyone's hearing the same message. Yes, but they may not all understand the message in the same way. So it may be better, it's more time-consuming, I'll give you that, but it may be better to do it in more small groups or department-wise so you can tweak that message little by little to hear what they need to hear so that they can walk out of that meeting going, aha, I get it. I get where the company's going and how it impacts my department and my job specifically. Okay, next step. What's your role in all of this? What is leadership's role in setting our course, in delivering on this message, and in maintaining the culture that we want? Okay, so when I look at this, it comes back to communication. Regular, open, honest communication in terms that our people can understand and apply to their experience. I remember way back in my UPS days, you know, when, I, when I first started in HR there 30 years ago, uh, we did a lot of like, you know, VHS, you pop the VHS in, and uh, like during employee orientation, and they'd see the boxes coming down the line, and everything was pretty, and everything was square, and people were like, hey, you know, I'm lifting the boxes. That was nothing like what happens in the operation when there's thousands of boxes of all different shapes and sizes and weights, and people are dirty and they're sweaty because they're working hard. Like, come on, you're not telling us what life is really like here, okay? Don't sugarcoat things to make people feel good. It always backfires. So when you're communicating, when you're living out what you're living out, acknowledge the dirt and the dust and the skeletons and things that you're dealing with and attempting to work through. People see it, and they know you see it, so why don't we all just admit that we see it, right? And that we're working on it. That will buy you more leverage than you can possibly imagine. And then... Make sure that your team is being held responsible for bringing your vision to life. It's absolutely critical. I shared the example of the credit union where several members of the executive team wouldn't even tell their friends at a cocktail party that they worked for this credit union. There's no way they can be that they were going to be successful. And obviously we did make some massive changes in personnel there. Because there's no way, if they're not bought in, there's no way they can lead others. Can you imagine how they were telling their people to interact with the customers that were coming in and requesting loans and wanting to make deposits? Holy mackerel. Um, very dangerous stuff. And so I would expect you to have your leadership team not only held accountable for driving business results, but being held accountable for driving the vision of the organization and for driving this line of sight in their areas of responsibility. And so this is where things get interactive, right? We've put the message out there. We're walking the talk. We're, ta we're walking the message. Now we can really get somewhere with our people. Once we, we build this open and honest communication, what starts to come out of that with our people? If you have an open and honest relationship, what comes out? Okay, questions, which is good. What else comes out if we're open and honest with the answers? Think about your personal relationships. If you have an open and honest relationship, what comes out of that? Thank you, it's trust. Trust comes out of it. When we have the trust of our people... There is nothing that will stop us from hitting our business results. There is nothing more important for us as leaders and for our leadership teams than to build trust with our people. 
But a couple things have to happen before that happens. Your people got to know that you care about them. And they got to know that you can help them. In other words, help them in their careers, help to develop them. Once they know that you care enough about them and that you can help them in their careers, they will offer trust to you. And so that's where the interactive approach gets really fun. And that's where we start to see the buy-in. People are willing to offer that branch of trust and see what happens. And hopefully we don't break that trust. Okay? And so they start to look for processes that will support what you're talking about. I worked with a, a telephone call center one time that said they wanted one call resolution. In other words, when the customer called, right, you didn't have to tell your story to five different people five different times. You told your story once, that person was empowered to handle the situation and resolve that customer's issue. That was what their mission was. But guess what process they had in place? They were measuring their phone reps on how many calls they took an hour. Does that make any, I heard a couple groans. That makes no sense, right? You're going you're gonna to pay me for how many calls I take, but you're also going to tell me, on the other hand, that you want one call resolution. Well, what if that one call takes an hour? Now I'm getting heat from my supervisor because I only took one call this hour. And Sue over there just took 20. But maybe I was really doing my job according to the mission. So look at your processes. Are they at odds with what's coming out of your mouth in terms of your vision for the organization and where you want to take it? And then it's time to get rid of those processes and revamp them. Don't hold on to them like, oh, we've always done it this way. Oh, worst thing you can ever say in business, right? Well, we've always done this. We're going to keep doing it this way. No, times are changing. Let's make sure those processes meet with our vision. Okay? Final step is to measure success. Pick just a couple of key data points. I was recently uh, wrapped up a project with a long-term care facility. The executive, I said, let me see your, your key measurables. How many do you think there were? 50? No, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> 15, almost. 13. He was measuring 13 things. I said, you can't measure 13 things. Yes, I can. And I said, then why am I here? Why, why, are, why did the board bring us in to help figure out why you are failing? You can't measure 15 things. Now, I'm not saying you don't have goals and everything else that, that rattle down, but at that level, at the executive level, if you're only focused on two, three, maybe four things, the real key things that matter, you are going to see business results. Warren Buffett famously said, write down 50 things you want to accomplish today, or this week, or this month, and then do just the five most important. Think about the wisdom in that. If you try to accomplish 50 things, that's more than one thing a day, even if you gave yourself a whole month to try and accomplish it. Okay, most of us can't get that much done, not because we're not productive, but that's scatterbrained. But pick the five that really have the biggest impact. They're going to drive your personal satisfaction or those of the, the company, whatever, and wow, you'll knock it out of the park. So try when you're looking at your measures to keep them simple, keep just a few in place. All right? Because ultimately, it comes back to whether or not you can hold your managers accountable for them and not accept you know, the excuses that will inevitably happen for why they've got, still got high turnover in their department or why their people are still sour uh, or why we can't recruit well in that department. Okay? Those are all indicators that something is going wrong. No Jelly of the Month Club. Please, please, please. If you take nothing else from this morning, okay, do not change your goals constantly. Stick with them. Now, obviously, there are going to be times, like pandemic hits, right? And we just throw everything out the window. We say, okay, we've got to figure something out. And everyone said, what do we have to do? We have to pivot. It was the famous thing last year. We've we got to pivot. We've got to pivot. We've got to do something, something different, okay? It's going to happen. We learned that 
in the last year. But what I'm talking about is once you set your goals, if you know these goals are going to support your business results, then stick with them. Give them a chance to play out. You get six, nine months and they're not working, okay, then it's time to tweak and figure out what's going on. Maybe they were bad goals. Maybe they weren't set up properly. Um, Maybe we're just not executing the way we need to execute, but stick with them. You know, keep that stiff upper lip, stick with your goals, make sure your management team is sticking with their goals, and in a way, don't take no for an answer. Like, yes, we said these goals are important. We're going to make this happen. You'll be amazed at what happens. So alignment's created. We've got our people focused. We've got them engaged. We've got their attention. What do we do with it? Okay? We've got to keep them motivated now. Lots of different ways to motivate people. Some of those Easter eggs are, in your, are going to be in your handout. We're going to talk about just pay for a moment, okay? and specifically variable pay. Because I want you to think about it. I believe the employment relationship is this simple. Someone comes to us for a job, we say, we can offer you these working conditions, this rate of pay, and they say, hmm, okay, I will accept those working conditions and that rate of pay, and in exchange for that, I'm going to give you my time, talent, and efforts. Done. It's that simple, really. We make the employment relationship something very hard. No, it's not. It is this simple, okay? Here's what happens, though. We hire someone in and everything's happy, right? Everything's in balance. And then Joe quits. And we realize, you know what? Maybe we could give Sue some of Joe's work. That's what we'll do. (laughs) Okay? Oh, and now um, Mary went out on paternity or uh, maternity leave, and so we're going to have Sue cover a little bit of her. (laughs) You see what happens? And this happens to all of us, right? We start adding on to the job or adding on to the expectations of the person... And the pay, the total rewards, does not stay in line. And that's when we have people not only getting burnt out and sour, but they say, adios. Like, this isn't what I signed up for. My total rewards are not commensurate with the effort and the results I'm driving for you. I had a a business owner uh, sit and tell me one time, he asked me for help in restructuring his salesman's commission structure. And by all accounts, I mean, they were killing it. And I said, why, why is it that you need to adjust this? He says, Ed, at the rate they're going, two of them are going to out-earn me this year. I said, so? What's the problem with that? Well, I own the company. Yeah? So what's the problem with them out-earning you? Well, I can't have an employee out-earning me. I said, okay, wait a minute. You're talking about out-earning you in, in pay, right? He says, absolutely. I said, because you still own the company. You've got the equity in the company and this building and everything that goes with it. He says, yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about pay. I said, okay, but wait a minute. Aren't they driving the value of your business? Why do you care that they're out-earning you? Pay them. Pay them for what they're worth. They're killing it for you. He said, Ed, I, that's not where I want to be. We've got to change this. I said, I'm not your guy to help you because it, it goes against everything I believe in. He had employees that were knocking his business results out of the park. And he wanted to turn around and say, eh, I'm going to pull that back. They're making too much. Wow, if you got superstars, take care of them. You know, you guys know. Is the talent market down here tough? It's tough all over. There's not a client I have that's not trying to hire right now. Not one. I'm not sure what's going on in the marketplace that everyone keeps telling us that, that um, there's all these people on unemployment and what's going on because I got clients that can't find people. From entry level to talent, they can't find them. So I'm not sure where all these folks are hanging out on employment, right? You guys probably don't know either, clearly. Okay, I don't know where they all are. We know we're in the war for talent. Now, can you imagine when this pandemic thing clears up, whatever that's going to look like, what's going to happen with people who maybe have been sour and been afraid to to make a move during all this mess, right? We're going to see a flood of talent on the market. And you may say, oh, cool, Ed, I'll get to hire my talent. No, I'm talking about you're going to lose some talent too, right? So think about this right now. What have you been asked, especially in the medical community? I mean, your people have been under fire for the last year, right, with all this mess. Um, And I'm not saying you have to up their pay just because of it, but whenever we start upping expectations, we got to up the ante on some other things. 
that the total rewards package has to level out with some other things, okay? And you have to ask your people what they want to help level that out. That's another talk for another time. Okay, who's responsible for this guy? Whose fault is he? How many of you would accept responsibility for this guy? Because you're, you're that person right there. That's you, okay? I had, you're, you're going to take responsibility for him? Yes, I'm going to let him stay in that chair. I'm responsible for letting him get away with that behavior. Okay, exactly. I had a business owner, I used this slide one time with a group of small business owners, and he said, I'd fire that guy. I said, good, you should fire him. I said, but whose fault is it that he's not enthusiastic anymore? Oh, well, it's his fault. I hire self-starters, and I hire this, and I hire that. I said, great. So either you hired him and made a mistake because he's not a self-starter, or you hired him because he was a self-starter, and you blew that flame out. So which is it? And I got the, yes, it's our fault as leaders. When that happens, it's our fault as leaders. Remember, the buck stops with us. A lot of people don't want to accept that. But when we put on that, that leadership shirt, the buck stops with us. We are responsible for our people. Okay? And when they lose their enthusiasm, then it's something to do with the message and the climate that we're setting in our organizations. We've taken our eye off the prize somewhere. And when I say we, maybe not you specifically, maybe someone on your team, Right? Maybe a manager further down, something along those lines. But this is always leadership's fault. Always, always, always. So here's some scary stats. Gallup says right now 51% of our workforce is not engaged. Does that surprise you? Shouldn't, especially during the crazy times we've been having, right? Um, people's minds are everywhere some days except on their work. Um, this one scares me. 34% of employees, according to Mercer, are saying, you know what, next 12 months I'm making a move. It's like they're waiting for the pandemic to be over. Like whenever the big announcement is that we're free of this, if that's going to happen, I don't know, right? But people are waiting and they're saying, you know, they're, it's like they're in the starting block. They're the sprint and the start. They're just waiting for that. That should scare us. It scares the heck out of me. This one is, is even odder. 59% of people say they would get out of their career, change their entire profession, if they could. Wow. Think about it. You guys are already struggling to find healthcare professionals, right? So what if 59% of your current employees said, you know what, I'm out of healthcare, to heck with it. That's a scary, scary stat for us as an industry. And that's not just specific to healthcare, that's in general. And we're seeing it especially with the millennial generation. And I'm not picking on the millennials. I'm just saying that we're seeing a different view of work from that generation where they're saying, you know what, I may want to have d totally different careers. I may not want to be, say, a nurse my entire career. Right? I may want to look at doing some different things. So how does that impact how we run our business when we're already struggling to find the right people? So I want you to take a, as we, we wrap up here, I want you to look at this list. Write down three things off of this list that you think your people want the most. Not in any order, just pick three. Jot them down. Which three of these are the most important to your people as kind of a retention and motivation driver? Okay, you got them? There's a study done around this. You're going to love this. Several hundred companies surveyed thousands of, of, of managers. And this is what managers said. So look at yours compared to what, what this says. How many of you had one of these top three on your list? Okay, a couple of you. Any, any of you have two of them? Anyone get the trifecta, have all three, you picked all three. No way, did you really? Okay, good for you. What's that? Right, but the top three, that the top three were the same. 
OK, OK. So we're at two. No problem. No problem. Two out of three ain't bad, right? That's the way the song goes. Here's the problem. Same study, same companies, employees of those managers, and this is what the employees said the problem is. Or, or not, excuse me, not the problem. What they want. Now, this is about where someone invariably throws something at me and says, Ed, that can't be right. People respond to their supervisor. What are you talking about? People quit their supervisor. I've been hearing it for years. It's just one study, folks, right? But what do these results tell you? What should we be concerned about? What's that? Alignment, right? Complete disconnect. Until we get down to, to management climate, which is fourth on the employees list, the top three on these lists, don't pair up at all. Huge disconnect. Yeah, but, you know, the, the, that's part of the problem, though, is no matter how much you pay them, no matter how many benefits you give them, no matter what, that it's never enough. Potentially. Potentially. It's based on... <laughs> Based on how we communicate, I'm not disagreeing with you, but how we sell it, okay? Um, but here's the thing. If we say it's this set and employees are saying something else is different, we can't be successful. So what I would ask you to do is to ask yourself right now, do I really know what my employees want? Do I really know what they want? And if you say, yes, I do, I know exactly what they wanted, my follow-up question is, okay, when's the last time you asked them about it? Most people haven't. So your second bit of homework is, ask your people what they want. What do they need to help you drive business results? Maybe it is more pay, but guess what? If they drive business results, which leads to more money in our pockets, we can afford to give them more money. We can actually work that method, that mathematical equation out. Okay? Yes, sir? So what do you say um, when you ask your employees what they want? You, you constantly do surveys, mm -hmm. bend over backwards to hear the employee to make changes what's better for the okay. employee, but those numbers do not change. Okay. So the question is, what do you do when you ask your employees what they want you try to make it happen, and the numbers don't move here, okay? Then I think it goes back to looking at the employment relationship. What are you expecting of your employees, and what are you giving them? And is it out of whack, okay? There are a couple things that are going to tell us whether it's out of whack. One is their lack of commitment to our goals, Second is, if you're looking at pay and you've got people saying, well, you know what, I got a second cousin who's married to my, you know, whatever down the street and they said they're earning 30 bucks an hour and you're paying me 22 bucks an hour. Great, good for that person making 30 bucks an hour, okay? But you really want to know what's going on in the marketplace, you have to do a legitimate market pay study to find out what's going on in the marketplace for the talent that you are recruiting in the market areas you are recruiting. You have to know that information. Not just, I had someone say the other day, oh, Ed, I don't do formal surveys because I just, I read in the newspaper what, you know, what ads are, or I hear it on the radio, they're paying 10 bucks or 12 bucks, so I kind of know what's going on. No, 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 that is not a formal salary study. We've got to go more, deeper than that, and we've got to go wider than that. We have to know, in our geographic area, the specific uh, positions that we have and what our competitors are paying those people. And if we find that we're paying 30 bucks an hour and the market is 28 bucks an hour, then those people who constantly want more and more, I'm going to sit down with them and say, okay, look, base pay, this is what the market is. And here's what I studied. I've got, you know, 50 other organizations with your type of position. The average pay is 28 bucks. You're at 30. They average $2,000 in incentive pay. You get a $5,000 bonus based on performance every year. Our benefits package is worth X, okay? Now, they have to choose at that point whether they're, they're going to say, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. But the second part of asking your people from a total rewards perspective, we see benefits in this survey was at the top. Ask your people what they want 
from a benefit, from a non-monetary standpoint. Don't just assume, oh, well, we got top-notch health care. Okay, great. Studies say millennials don't care. So spend even your benefits money wisely and on things that your people are saying they want. If your employees want pet insurance, offer doggone pet insurance to them, right? It's crazy. You're shaking your head like, oh, this is nuts. But if that's what they want, give it to them. I was helping an accounting firm out a number of years back that um, was having trouble recruiting new accountants out of college. And they kept saying, Ed, we pay more than our competition and we can't draw them in. I said, what are you hearing? And they said, well, we keep hearing that our competition's giving them all smartphones. And we try to tell them that, well, you know what, that with the extra pay, you can go get your own smartphone. I said, take the extra pay away and give them a smartphone. You make out in the deal. Yeah, but that's not right. But it's what they want. So give them what they want. And when I finally convinced HR to do that, guess what happened? They got back on a level playing field and they were saving money. Okay? So I know we've talked a little bit about money here as we wrap up. And money is not the, the, the end-all, be-all solution in all cases. But what I would say is, make sure that you are spending your money wisely. Don't just throw more pay at someone. Don't just reduce um, medical co-pays or out-of-pockets or whatever because you think it's what your people want. Ask them. Have dialogue with them so that you know that the effort that they're giving is being rewarded commensurate, okay? Make sure that that's, those scales stay in balance. Now, I'm not a pie-in-the-sky guy. I know there are going to be people that you are never going to satisfy. I get it. They're out there. What I would ask you is, is that the kind of person you want working in your organization then? Are they truly committed to your business results and your vision? Now, I know that comes on the heels of saying we know talent is hard to come by and everything else, right? This is why we get paid the big bucks, to solve these problems. Okay? So I will leave you with this. Anytime you touch the employment relationship, no matter what it is, a training program, pay, a benefits program, time off, you name it, anytime you touch that, Anytime you touch someone's workload, level of responsibility, level of duties, give yourself the mental check and say, okay, what am I doing to the employment relationship balance? Am I keeping it in there? If I'm asking someone to go above and beyond, what can I do to incent them to go above and beyond to drive that business result? Because I'm going to leave you with one last scary stat. It takes a 7% pay increase to change someone's behavior. I don't know about you guys, and when the last time you gave 7% pay raises out. So don't expect that you're going to give the 2% a year and you're going to get different results. Doesn't happen. And if you really want to drill it down, think of it this way. Simple math. If you have a person making $50,000 a year and you give them a 2% raise, what does that equal? Come on, where are my CFOs? It's a thousand bucks. Come on, guys. A thousand bucks, right? But do they get the whole thousand dollars? No, Uncle Sam's got his share, right? So let's just take 300 bucks out of that. They got $700 now. And now, do they get that $700 on a weekly basis? No, probably bi-weekly or whatever, right? So do that math. I don't know what it comes out to. All I know is it gets you pe pepperoni on your pizza is really what it does, okay? And when you think of it in those terms, you have to ask yourself, oh, so I just gave someone pepperoni on their pizza every other Friday with their paycheck, and now I'm expecting them to do even more for me. Doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Now, I'm not saying don't give your people raises. Don't walk out of here and say, well, that guy, he's off his rocker. He just said not to give people raises. No. I'm saying, if you're going to give people that $1,000, think about how it would be best to give it to them. Is it in the pepperoni every other week? Or is it a $700 spot check? Boom. And it's a bonus instead of a merit increase. Maybe you do look at it that way. Because if it's near Super Bowl time or something, they go out, they buy the big screen TV, 
And there's some studies that would indicate that every time I hit that TV on, and my friends are over watching the game on the big screen, and I say, that was my company bonus, that was my company bonus. And every time I click that TV on, it's a reinforcer. I worked, I got this thing. Go figure, I don't know. We could talk pay all morning. So my final message is, make sure that that balance stays in and that anything you do has the focus of attracting, retaining, and motivating your key talent. And I underscore key talent. So with that, I thank you for your time. I thank you for having me down to the wonderful state of Georgia. I look forward to seeing you again soon. My pleasure.